Hello, wherever and whenever you're watching this, a very warm welcome to the Long Player Conversation 2021 in association with the British Library. Many thanks indeed to John Fawcett, his team there, and everyone at the Library for making this event possible. My name is Gareth Evans, and I'm the chair of the Long Player Trust. Long Player is a continuous piece of music that repeats only once every thousand years. It began playing at the turn of the millennium and was created by Jem Finer and produced by Art Angel. It's housed here in the lighthouse at Trinity Boy Wharf in the London Docklands and is modelled on the singing bowls you can see behind me. Not only is it a remarkable piece of sonic art, it's also a way of thinking, a framework for measuring how we are in the world and how we might be in the future. A very uncertain future, of course, as we all know. Long Player provides a register, a kind of measure for our thinking about the way we want to be, the forms of identity and the forms of society we want to think about making into the future. The Long Player Trust is tasked not only with promoting Long Player in the short term, but thinking exactly that, how Long Player might continue to play over the rest of its thousand year span. This of course requires visionary thinking from all parts of society if we are to survive into that time span and beyond which is why the conversation is such a central part of Long Player's activities. You can find all details of previous conversations, which started in 2005, on the Long Player website at longplayer.org. You can also visit the lighthouse where I'm currently standing and see Long Player in action and the supporting material around me. But most of all, you can listen to Long Player here in the lighthouse or online, of course, at longplayer.org or via the app. The conversation has been running, as I said, since 2005, and we are really delighted to have two wonderful guests among the most innovative and engaged thinkers of our time to think through the very issues that I have just raised. One of the ways you can support Long Player, which receives no core funding to enable these events to go onward into the future, and of course for Long Player itself to continue to play, is to support it in the various ways and means that you might, might know, but particularly and distinctively through the Buying Time Project, in which you can sponsor a day, any day, from the calendar year, for yourself or for a loved one, and leave a trace of that support in the buying time cabinet here at the Lighthouse in the London Docklands. More on that at the end, when I will return uh, to manage the questions which you can file through the online form of this platform, and they will be passed to me uh, to relay to our wonderful guests uh, in due course. But now let me remind you of who our wonderful guests are. We are delighted to welcome, of course, the artist, the author and the academic, Denise Ferreira da Silva, and the scholar, writer and cultural collaborator, Timothy Morton. They will be talking about social and ecological justice, about deep time, about the Anthropocene, and about exactly what we have been mentioning already, long player and how it can think for us uh, about these crucial issues, which really are at the heart of our societal future. I'm very, very glad that you can be with us for this very special conversation. And now, please, wherever you are, do join me in welcoming Denise Ferreira de Silva and Timothy Morton. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so deeply honoured and touched to be part of this conversation with my, with my good friend, Denise. We've known each other for about four years. <clears throat> but let me introduce myself first, and then um, uh, Denise will introduce herself. Um, when I do this normally, I say something like, hello, my name is Tim, and I write sentences about ecological awareness, which makes me sound like I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous or something. Um, but in general, people call me a philosopher, although I wouldn't dare to call myself that, actually. Um, I think what I would say, though, is that the word philosophy is actually made of two emotions. You know, it's the word love and the word wisdom. And if you had a choice between... You know, wisdom is a series of ideas on a fortune cookie or wisdom is a feeling. I think you would have to go with wisdom is a feeling. And I know that this is not normal, you know, like like normal, regular philosophers are all about having really big ideas and, you know, comparing the, the big ideas with the other people's big ideas. But for some reason, I, I can't do that or I won't do that. Um, and for me, the philosophy is all about movement. You know, the, the word emotion implies a kind of movement. And it's almost like you're driving down the wisdom street 
and there are the lampposts and the lampposts are called ideas but you don't want to like concentrate on them too hard otherwise you might wrap yourself around one at least that's that's my sense of things um let me introduce you to denise who's going to tell tell you guys a little bit about herself Oh, hi, hello, hi, Tim. Thanks for um, uh, introducing me and for this conversation. So I am, uh, I am an academic, I think. I've been for a while now and uh, also a practicing artist. Um, yeah, philosophy is also part of my, of my craft, uh, but I, maybe I don't, I get at it from uh, the other way, which is not an opposite way, it's just another way through the thinking. So, and I, I and through the thinking from the thinking about something very, uh, or apparently minute, to the think of things so abstract that no one really cares about, <laughs> about them. Uh, or, or, or perhaps they say they don't care about them. Um, so, and that and, and that move from the minute to you know to the very abstract is uh, present and informs um, pretty much all, all the work I do from the films in collaboration with Arjuna Neumann through the um, sensing salon practice with uh, Valentina Desideri, but but also that collaborative practice that we you know have in the classroom with graduate and undergraduate students. But there I am mostly interested in, you know, getting them to exercise their, their thinking and their curiosity and then, and hopefully uh, bring some elements that they have not, had not considered before. So they can continue and amplify and, you know, narrow or expand the conversations they engage in however they wish. Now, um, Denise and I have prepared a little plan for this evening, um, and I feel like it might be Denise's turn to ask me a question that I'm going to address, and then I'll ask Denise something and we'll proceed from there. How, how do you feel about that, Denise? Um, I feel like it's uh, an excellent way of going about it, especially because the question I have for you is about thinking. <laughs> Um, and it is about uh, the trajectory of your thinking, but uh, let me quote from Ecology Without Nature, which was published, what, 14 years ago, I think, a while ago, isn't it? Um, and, and, I, and I would like to quote from, from that book because it's been very important in my own way into ecological thinking. Um, but then there is something about the thinking itself. So I, I'm quoting from page 12. Uh, Instead of lumping together a list of things and dubbing it nature, the aim is to slow down and take the list apart and to put into question the idea of making a list at all. Ecology without nature takes seriously the idea that truly theoretical reflection is possible only if thinking decelerates. This is not the same thing as becoming numb or stupid. It's finding anomalies, paradoxes, and conundrums in an otherwise smooth looking stream of ideas. So I thought that it would be great to start the conversation uh, with you, know, you commenting on the trajectory of your thinking since ecology without nature. So what happened? How has it moved? How has it translated? Where have you gone? Um, and I'm asking because right now there is this sense of urgency, right? This sense of, of very little time or no time um, and of being out of time, being too late in regards to, to addressing global warming. Um, and then at the same time, that is the long player which is going to be playing for so many, many, many years to come. How, are your think how is your thinking between, you know, right now, or maybe too late, and then this expense of a thousand years uh, that the long player will be with us. Gosh, thank you so, thank you so much. That's a beautiful question. And um, you know, um, when I say decelerate, I'm taking the advice of my old uh, friend Jacques Derrida, who used to say to his graduate students that the most important thing is to is to slow down. Um, 
And of course, um, since then, actually, I feel like my thinking has slowed down even more. Um, to some extent, I was kind of skimming over some things when I wrote that book, Denise, and a little bit that was because I, I um, wanted to get published, to be honest with you, that it was important to get through some kind of metal detector into the VIP lounge of, of, of being a published author on this topic. And I knew that the people who would be assessing the book for Harvard University Press might have some thoughts about me being very harsh on this concept of nature. So I was trying super hard to be a little bit gentle and oblique. And so part of it is that the thinking is slowed down and it's more kind of like fe feeling my way along now, um, more intuitively. And also that the feeling and the thought has gotten louder and louder and louder um, let's cut to the chase. Ending white supremacy and patriarchy are logically foundational to any progressive ecological project. That is something that I firmly believe and I strongly feel like people like me should talk a lot less actually right now about, about non-human beings, um, so we want to call them, and uh, talk more about these issues. I also feel like Black Lives Matter is the one of the very first planet scale movements of collective political awareness and action as is me too actually and that this is very good news because you know just in time for collective political awareness and action to be happening on on the climate catastrophe um, we have something in the world that is just as big as transnational corporation or uh, transnational religion both of which in their ways are, are, are responsible for some of the Big problems that we in which we find ourselves and so if anything um my way of thinking about things got sort of louder you know and i just started just kind of oh let's just say what i need to say and, and 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 that's funny denise because i had a post-it note on my computer when i was writing ecology without nature that, just, that, that basically said just tell people what you think because i was one of these very very you know trying to be right academics you know and like every sentence had to be perfect and every sentence had to be right and therefore there was only about three people who read my stuff st 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 and I could hardly get the words out you know and so I decided I would just try to say what I really thought more directly and make myself a little bit more kind of vulnerable there but even though I, I'd been a bit careful publishing that book I did actually receive amazingly I got death threats for, for saying that ecology should be without nature that some people actually thought this tim doesn't believe in dolphins he doesn't think they're real and the point is i believe in them so much this concept of nature is actually the thing that's getting in the way um nature as it were is normative in other words it means that there has to be something unnatural um to define it as it were and i feel again like um in particular white supremacy and patriarchy are structuring this binary opposition between human beings and so-called nature and that the job of something like deconstruction from, from my point of view is to sort of discover that the the line between these two things is actually very very thick it's not thin and rigid and actually it contains all kinds of strange anomalies that make that binary un, untenable so i was sort of doing that um in a way that would get seen um, by um, my wonderful editor, actually, Lindsay Waters of Harvard University Press. And then gradually since then, just getting more and more explicit. Another thing that it was about was like, let's do some cognitive mapping, like Frederick Jameson was saying, you know, let's just find out what the hell is actually going on before we figure out what. And it seemed to me that left ways of talking about this were somehow stuck in all kinds of issues. And I know that we share um, deep, negative thoughts actually about about Hegel for example um, who is often I feel impeded the discussion as far as this goes and um, this actually leads me to my to my question for, for for you Denise which is that you know this idea of transparency I, I teach this concept of yours all the time because I feel like it's key to actually understanding how how speciesism is actually deeply structured by racism and that um, your argument, in fact, that any subject object dualism is always a master slave duality has become for me an incredibly powerful um, way of thinking about 
um, human relations with, with non-human beings. And how concepts such as the, the inhuman or the subhuman are, are sort of structuring this binary. So I was wondering if you could say a few words about that in, in turn. Um, yes, yeah, so well, thank you so much for, uh, for the answer uh, to my question. It's, uh, it's amazing to see how, you know, our thinking, how it responds to, to challenges that um, sometimes they have always been there and sometimes they, they just take a different, you know, a different uh, shape as, as they, they appear to. to us. And, I, and I'm kind of saying that um, because even my thinking with uh, the notion of transparency has changed a little bit since 2007, <laughs> also when toward the global idea of race was, was published. And, and I think the shift was, um, but also very much influenced by, by post-structuralism. And, uh, but, but a shift even within, you know, my, how I have been influenced by post-structuralism. So when I introduced this uh, phrase, uh, the transparent eye into our the global idea of race, and thinking primarily as the figuring of, of man in the, you know, at the beginning of the 19th century, I was still very much influenced, or, or maybe not influenced, I was still very much thinking with Michel Foucault, on the one hand, and attempting to, to understand that passage or to convey that passage from what Foucault calls the classical order to what he calls the modern episteme. And that was a refiguring, that in that passage, that was a refiguring the subject from what Sylvia Winter calls man, man one, the rational being, and to what she calls man two, which is the selected by evolution. But what I saw in that passage in, in, with Hegel, <laughs> with Hegel intervention, was precisely that transformation of, of the rational entity, which was separated from everything else as nature, right? into something that was confounded with everything else, with nature itself, because nature, nature, right, this normative thing you're mentioning, nature was redefined re, re as being, but that, that the subject in the moment when it doesn't yet know that it is a manifestation of spirit. So that was what I was looking at at that moment. But over the many, you know, the many years between then and now, as I, I spent more time uh, attending to, not so much, uh, not more time attending to, but as I, I kind of expanded my attention to racial subjugation from primarily its juridical moment, right? You know, my, my focus have, has been for a long time on police brutality. As I moved from police brutality and started looking more at human rights, at the whole human rights framework and the ways in which that framework has been deployed in, uh, as, in a way as a mechanism of global subjugation, and we can talk more about that, then I, I found that, in a deep, that then it was the notion of cultural, cultural difference that it had even more of a, a fundamental role in the limiting the reach of humanity itself as, as an ethical principle. So then, then I moved more towards the division <laughs> uh, approach um, and more, more towards the division approach. In particular, uh, you know, I became uh, obsessed with uh, something that Derrida says, I think is in the force of law about justice, if such a thing exists. Um, and I became obsessed with the say, uh, with the, the move towards say, asking instead of asking you know of stating if such a thing exists, considering more the, the impossibility of such a thing as justice, um, as global justice, as uh, also such a thing as social justice, global justice, racial justice, precisely because the concept that animates our notion of justice, humanity. Is it's not on, not only it refigures 
that you know, the thesis of transparency, humanity is still the transparent eye. But in addition to that, as it works with uh, the tools of raciality, it also re reproduces these others, right? Which, you know, um, these other varieties uh, of humans. But then at the same time, reproducing that distinction between the human and nature, which is so crucial to uh, ecological thinking. Right, it's which is you know, as you that which you refer with uh, the term speciesism. Um, yes, I think that's well. You know, this concept of justice brings up the notion of the future. You know, then and, and maybe there's two different kinds of future on the table. Roughly, there's the future that we can predict, and then there's the possibility of the future. The possibility that things can be different and oh my goodness, we are living in a moment in which we could really use some sense that the, that the future could be different from the past, because, you know, look around you, the, the capitalism and so forth is munching down the biosphere to nothing. And um, people need a sense of things could be different, that in fact there are alternative ways of, of, of being. And so I deeply respect anybody who wants to um, hold open this doorway or this gateway um, and yeah, to me, the, the, it's very, it's beautiful how you put it, like the possibility of justice in a way is, 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 is um, more, uh, what's the right word, fertile or, or creative than any instance of um, justice. Um, it it, it kind of goes all the way back to Plato and the way that he made Mino's head explode by saying, you know, you're just giving me an example of justice, whereas in fact, this is a concept that transcends but then on the other hand it can't transcend um, this world otherwise we wouldn't be able to enact it at all and so it's a beautiful paradoxical and very important concept I feel and um, you know if, if long player means anything it, it, it has to do with opening up the possibility that things can be different rather than repeating uh, the same and we're sort of hoping that people will be able to visualize um, the future even visualize anything would be good right now. Th things are so sort of beaten down. I talk a lot to uh, Extinction Rebellion youth and they feel like very, very upset all the time. And it, like, like how to help people, all people like, feel, feel like they can get out of bed in the morning and actually do something in the name of this justice. But isn't it, well, it's good you, you brought uh, Extinction Rebellion and, uh, and the issue of time, right? Because justice as as a, as a concept it's out of time but it is in time right it is it's justice is to come right but it's but because it's to come it is in time and it is also to come in the space into the place in which we we are but in now in this moment you know as we as we're facing more more seriously and more you know it's almost impossible not to to pay attention to global warming, this sense of urgency mm. robs time, right? There is no time, as, as, I, was, uh, as I was saying before. So what, what, then, what then becomes possible when there is no time? Not because there is no time in the present, but because there is no, there is no future, there is no way of anticipating something like a future. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, to me, then the challenge becomes um, one of bringing about now, this moment, living on the planet, changing the ways in which we exist on this planet in this moment, from the minor way, micro ways to the major macro wow. imaginable ways, right now, right? Yeah. And, 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 and every, so if it is right now, then that urgency might, you know, if we bring that 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 future to this moment, then that urgency will no longer be something that, in a way, tends to to stop you, right? Because because you, for humans, when there is no time, there is nothing to be done. But if it is about now, then there is always something that can be done. Mm -hmm. Now, I love how you're thinking on a number of different scales of time and space at the same at the same moment, right? And how these different scales don't cancel each other out necessarily, even though they're a little bit different from each other. And it makes me think about your concept of, of fractal thinking versus linear thinking. 
Um, it's a very suggestive essay that you shared with me and you know that people have become super linear you know like so I we, 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 we were talking a few weeks ago about how there was a tropical storm that rolled into Houston and I went to the supermarket and you know there were these young white men who have never seen in the supermarket before and they're piling the, 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 the trolleys full of all the stuff including the toilet paper and it include it, it sort of occurred to me that this toilet paper was a symbol not only for maintaining this barrier between the inside and the outside but also a kind of um reenactment of the primitive accumulation right like let's just get this huge pile of things and then we can automate it and that this is what people default to um that uh, white supremacy defaults to um my uh, friend amitav ghosh is is thinking that the it's the colonial imperial aspect of um capitalism that's the key problem with it and it and your concept of fractal thinking seemed to me to be trying to find a way to think outside of that of that box in terms of in terms of time and space. And so I wondered if you might be able to speak speak to that a little bit, Denise. Um, yes. Um, so fractal thinking is um, an idea that came to me as I, I I got a little bit irritated with uh, uh, doing. Uh, with some contemporary philosophers who will go remain unnamed as they were commenting on the European refugee crisis like about five, six years ago. And, um, and they repeated this, um, uh, our general you know, understanding of time as not only as linear, but then at the same time as you know, as as made out of those different moments, and then once something stops, then it stay, it's ended and it stays in the past. So there mm -hmm. was something called colonialism, and then it went away. It's there, no irrelevant. There was something called slavery. It ends. Was that it happened? And, and I, I, I am absolutely unable <laughs> to see uh, things stop, you know, to, to, to inhabit this particular, um, you know, sense of time. And I, so there is that, there is that irritation. And then at the same time, I, um, as we are going to probably talk more about it, I, you know, I, am, I have been so totally into science fiction on the one hand, and the whole idea of time travel is very crucial in my thinking. And then on the other hand, I have spent the last 30 years or more reading on, on, on particle physics and, and quantum field theory. And then of course, this is all part of, part of my thinking. So as I was attending to how these, philo these uh, philosophers were describing the refugee crisis as if you know, something that just happened in the Middle East and in the African continent, and that had nothing to do with the history of colonialism and new colonialism and imperialism, I just started considering like one basic simple what if question. And the what if question was like, okay, right? Maybe there is no way to uh, stop people from having this idea of the historic as you know something happened and that something else happened you know and then they connect to each other but there is no continuation maybe that's impossible to 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 eliminate that kind of thinking at the same time it is difficult like to let go of this idea of a life you know of the the duration of a life of the of a life as an organic uh, phenomenon right so maybe as humans living entities on this planet we do you know experience at least not not the life of the species but the life of the individual this this makes a difference but then there is no reason why not to include also some other dimensions into the thinking and doing so simultaneously you know and those dimensions would be the quantic, right? We are all made out of those elementary particles of those things that have been recycling for you know millions and millions of years, and and the cosmic, which you know, of of the cosmic of space as the site of you know, uh, quote unquote, origin of all of that, of all of those um, um, particles. 
So the proposal for artifact of thinking is, is just that, right? It is an acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, you can't undo the ways humans think about or approach existence, but we, we, we can and should complexify. Uh, and, and not think in terms of scales, right? Um, mm. The complexification is about thinking it all at the same time as being the same scale, the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but well, now that we are talking about time <laughs> and and the, the fractal thinking, um, I I do I have um, I have a question for you uh, about thinking, right? Uh, because I'm I'm very much interested in 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 what you, I see you describing, uh, you've described as liquid thinking, or, or I mean, you talk, you, you talk about flu, liquid fluid space, but, um, and then here I'm obviously uh, commenting on, on uh, spacecraft, which is, which is a book that I, I, I like very much. Um, and then I just mentioned to you not, yeah, before we started that I, you know, I, spent more time with Star Trek. So the reference to Star Wars, I had to remember <laughs> them, but <laughs> still, we are liking the same thing. But I also love the fact that you are thinking with Luz Irigare. Uh, she's, you know, my a favorite, absolutely favorite of mine. And, um, but, but I think in your thinking, as it appears in, in, in the book, I can find that, you know, it is your book. So, you know, it's Timothy Morton in there, but I think you're bringing something else to object-oriented ontology. Something that uh, seems to me is more, um, there's a better job in the dislodging of the subject of the transparent eye, you know, the thinking subject. Mm. And, and, uh, and it, it, of course it has to do with your, you know, you, the moving with feminist thinking, non-European, you know, sub-Saharan African philosophy, mm -hmm. and the non-binary approach that you that you highlight. So, yes, I'd like you, you know, I'd like to hear more about this non-binary thinking, uh, and that you call fluid and liquid. Um, can you can you share with us? Oh, oh, oh for real, I would be honored to do that, and it's a it's a delight that you're reading. This book, which is a, which is my excuse to talk about not only Star Wars, which I saw the premiere in London in 1977, but also, unfortunately, and to a greater extent, more weirdly, the Muppet Show, um, which I think of as a kind of strangely post-human thing, and that the Rainbow Connection, the the song, if 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 I had my way, that would be our planetary anthem when we get to an age of of, of greater ecological justice for everybody. And that actually the rainbow is really hyperspace and that hyperspace is you 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 were saying about how things are happening now and we should we, we should actually work on the now and the, this beautiful concept i feel in afrofuturist art that hyperspace is sort of everywhere right and the and the idea is just how to find it you know it's sort of it, it's it's under this computer here it's sort of behind the screen you just have to feel figure out how to locate it then you can zoom because truly actually linear time um, this notion of being in a box is really just a tool, right? Like, you know, you're in you're some kind of European colonialist person from 16 something and you want to voyage around the Cape of Good Hope to get to the so-called Spice Island. So you're going to invent perspective geometry to do it and you're going to invent a certain time scale having to do with stock trading to fund it. And that's just a tool and you can sort of scale this notion of time to, to any size you want, depending on the task that you want to accomplish at the expense of other life forms usually and you bring up this notion of of, of a human life actually I, fi I find it very moving um, and I too am fascinated by the cosmic dimensions of all this um, and it's something I love in what you the way you think and um, the fact that you know in a funny way if 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 the universe truly was mechanical if if, you, if as you say it's a historical event happens here and then it and then another one happens like sort of dots on a Wikipedia line, if it was true, then in a way life could never actually happen, 
because to some extent, life is a quantum theoretical thing. It, it's slightly reversing entropy. And if time was always going in a line like this, there would be no life forms. So in a funny way, it's like life itself is saying something true about the structure of the universe, which is that it is a non-mechanical. And that in fact, the notion of life is not a biological concept, actually, nor indeed a juridical concept of life, but is in fact this kind of oscillating, vibrating, trembling quality, which I find extremely attractive about the quantum theory that is basically saying that, you know, fundamentally things are more like what we think of as liquids than they are uh, solids. And that actually um, the world is not made up of little cogwheels that are kind of manipulating each other, that in fact, it's much more like uh, flu uh, fluids. And you bring up Lucia Rigori. Um, I have, I, I, I read everything she wrote along with Julia Kristeva before I went to Oxford University. And of all the things that I studied in my literary theory class, it was those people who at that point were called French feminists, but I would prefer to just to think of them as French philosophers who happened to be writing in the late 1960s. There was a deep, profound influence on, on me. Um, and, you know, this idea that um, to be a thing is to be more like a liquid than a solid, that it you that, that it has no way to completely grasp or appropriate a thing, which doesn't mean that this thing continues underneath the appearances, no matter what, which I take actually to be a profoundly violent concept, that actually what it means is that things are fragile and finite, but they are also profoundly opaque if we want to use a, a word that I find very attractive in the work of Glissant, you know, that this notion of opacity, that you can never actually appropriate it with thinking or with eating or with making a picture of or as using an example of in a conversation with Denise, a, a thing, whether that thing be a spoon or a, or a galaxy or an idea. Um, and that really time is kind of like a liquid that kind of like sprays out of things. I happened to be in the Orangerie in, in, in Paris two weeks ago, and I was looking at the amazing Monet paintings there, and they were in a sort of oval, right, and they kind of surround you, so you cannot see them all at once directly, and th they have the same dimension, strangely enough, as, as the hyperspace slit scan tech that produced that effect in the, in the movies. The fascinating thing for me is that this image is actually from African philosophy. I don't know whether George Lucas directly appropriated it, but this concept of Kalunga in the Congo philosophy is a yeah. concept of a liquid that is between worlds. And it is uh, like a blue liquid in color, like the inside of a spiraling shell. And um, it is exactly, it's, it's, it's not the 2001 hyperspace, which I think is basically Versailles. It's, it's, it's not this kind of militarized hyperspace. It's actually a kind of um, uh, the utopian quality of, of a time without work, of a sort of unworking time where you can relax and be quiet. And, and there's a, a, a sort of kind of fruitfulness in that. Um, so I'm very, I'm very glad that you brought up this, this image. Yeah, I, I, I love the, you know, that you recalled, you know, this, I call it an image of existence, right? The, we call the image that these elementary, these elemental things, the, the particles, they are actually, they are vibrating, right? And they are vibrating at every, all the time, right? And, and because they are vibrating, as they are vibrating, they are also, um, you know, exchanging, transferring energy with, with each other, right? Transferring energy in the in the form of um, of uh, well, they call it phonons, right? The quasi particles used for measuring it. But we can also think of it in terms of uh, infrared radiation and um, and heat, heat in general. Right? Um, and I and I like it because this is you know one of the ways in which I have been you know approaching thinking about global warming. Um, think in terms of the, the excess, right? Uh, everything is oscillating all the time. We, heat is happening, right? The transfer of internal kinetic energy is taking place all the time. Anything that exists does it, right? The only, moment, the only condition under which heat is not happening is absolute zero temperature, which is something they approach in the labs, 
outside of the labs doesn't, as far as anyone knows, um, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. And to me, you know, like following these, I mean, following the line of, of, of thinking beyond linear time, um, beyond, you know, me uh, mechanical, the mechanical order of nature, right, that, that description you were mentioning, um, one, one could, um, you know, at this moment right now, just also, um, you know, take, oh, no, appropriate, take, and, and, and um, I don't even know exactly what, what the verb is, but maybe exist with that, that image of, of heat, uh, you know, of heat taking place, which means basically that also that one thing transforms and transfers and or transduce into another, you know, pieces of ice like circulating at all this time. And uh, as, I, as I was saying before, I've been using this image to, to think about global warming and colonial subjugation at the same time, um, mm. in the sense that, you know, well, the accumulation of green, you know, greenhouse gas is caused by primarily <laughs> the fuel <laughs> that's being extracted <laughs> in former colonial uh, spaces, but with the, but that can be extracted precisely because of the operation of mechanisms of total violence that are very much colonial, right? Mm -hmm. The excess, you know, of those of, the, of those greenhouse gases is also the excess of violence, the, of the violence that is deployed, that has been deployed uh, in order to extract these uh, this fuel, and and then you know, but obviously for thinking. And, uh, uh, you know, with that kind of materiality requires that, that shift, right? It requires the shift from here to, to then and from there to here and here to now, right? It really, thinking of things oscillating is, I, I, I find, is a way of, of thinking about move, movement. Uh, it's movement without dislocation, right? So it's movement without space and time. It is a movement that is inherent to nature, which in a way completely displaces the, 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 the context of, of the subject, of the transparent subject, uh, of the binary, and then of binary thinking, in, you know, as we, uh, as we have lived with, lived with it. So beautiful, Denise. Like the, um, some philosophy wants to get rid of movement or sort of explain it away. But for me and you, it seems as if movement, which isn't about going from A to B, in fact, um, but is something much more intrinsic to the structure of how things actually are, is a very precious thing. And one of the things that I find very beautiful, actually, about the quantum theory is that there is no transparent energy, as it were. There's red energy and there's purple energy and there's green energy and there's blue energy, but there is no such thing as unmarked transparent energy and this I find to be an extremely friendly you know I mean a lot of um, people who talk about quantum theory make it sound so kind of sort of intense you know and it, and, and it is but also I think it's a very kind and friendly idea that there is no such thing as a kind of underneath energy that is totally transparent and is sort of underneath everything you know that is always something that is always that thing that's something there which is material right so I like to think of this movement as a as a constant constant redecomposition. That's the movement of matter, right? The material mm. things they just redecompose, um, you know, redecompose at all all the time. And um, how how to think a world that is beyond the efficiency, right? How and how to think in a way that is maybe bigger is the wrong word, but more agile, and how to kind of get out from under the machinery that is not just in the material world, but is in the thought world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and presents something like a utopian way of thinking that could enable people to slip out from under. I feel like efficiency in a way is, is, is when, when, when you say excess, I'm thinking my, when, when I say efficiency, that the efficiency metric of a kind of algorithm called capitalism that is munching down the biosphere with greater and greater accuracy um, and how it might be good to get out from underneath it. But I'm talking of getting out from underneath things, it might be time 
for me to say, mm -hmm. Gareth Evans, the wonderful mm -hmm. director of this, told me to say a safe word, and the, this word is safe word. I couldn't think of another safe word. So I'm gonna <laughs> say safe word, and Gareth is gonna appear, and he's going to moderate questions, which is marvelous. Thank you so much, first of all, for laying out this incredible landscape of creative, imaginative, and intellectual possibility. And I'm now just going to really just try and tease forward on behalf of our wonderful audience some of the thoughts they've had while they've been listening to you. And we've had some wonderful questions coming in, thoughts, responses. Um, many thanks indeed to Sarah for navigating this on our behalf um, through the BL's platform. Now, we're going to go straight into this, if we may. And I mean, I think really, please do take this, either of you, both of you, in whichever way you see fit, um, whoever would like to lead on these things. Some of these questions very much are for both of you and others, perhaps with a slightly uh, 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 more singular focus. But if I could, I could just take forward some of the thinkers that you've been uh, engaging with in your conversation. And the first uh, question came in, uh, post-structuralist thought can make anything seem possible. I'm thinking here, says the questioner of, of Deleuze and Guattari in the body without organs as an example and the inherent risk to identity that comes with such physical and psychological openness. Is this a concern of yours when thinking about possible radical futures? And how do you reconcile these two positions? The idea that anything might be possible and the risk to identity that comes with such openness. I'd love to hear from both of you perhaps on, on, on your thoughts on that. Mm. Uh, shall I go? Okay. Um, thank you, Gareth, for um, for moderating this um, this part of the the conversation. Um, it is, isn't it? It 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 it's, it feels a bit scary to think at the same time that it is possible to think in such a way as to um, not not rely on any any given. Um, solid, quote unquote, solid firm basis. Um, but then we should also remember that the very notion of identity, the very notion that that is one, that different things, including the human humans, are uh, I, to be identified in one possible way, in the, that one single uh, Form through that one single form, be that a category or or um, or something else, or or, a, or the place of residence. Um, to to make it simple, to me is also it's it has to be taken into account, right? So so it's let me say it's not a matter of choice. I think it's a matter of movement and a matter of a matter of itinerary, and it is always an itinerary that is guided by a certain intention. In my, in my, my, in my case, for the most part, my thinking, my itinerary is guided by this concern with the impossibility of global justice, the impossibility of social justice, with the operations of the cis heteropatriarchal matrix and the violence that it authorizes and that it, it deploys. In order to map, and confront these violences. There are post-structuralist strategies have been helpful towards undermining precisely, towards exposing precisely, precisely the pretense of not having a solid ground of being transparent. And, and towards, um, and this move towards justice is also a way of perhaps um, safeguarding what you know you who is asking the question may be thinking about um identity right in 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 the ways but not not in the ways in which identity is presented or is, is supported or has been constructed by um you know by the tools of, of modern knowledge that is post structuralists usually usually attack so i think i think i'm saying something that is that takes both both of those moments that you see contradictory into account, but place them in a larger context, which is the one that I'm defining here with global justice, whatever mm. it means. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. I'd love to hear I, from you. I would love to it. add to that. Thank you, Denise. I mean, <laughs> another word, another one word for anything could happen is creativity. You know, and I feel like a, a, a world that is more 
attuned to you know um being kind and 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 all that to, to more life forms including human ones is going to feel to us like failures and starting and stopping and getting it wrong and realizing that you can't get it completely right um in particular i'm struck by what denise is saying about the about about the way when you stress test this notion of of justice it really does break down i mean in in my sense it's based on a notion of property and if if nothing can be property then then we can't have any justice in a certain way um so we need another way of thinking but to us you know who are very addicted to creativity to efficiency thanks very much exxon and chevron who who work you know a couple of miles that way where i'm pointing um the any kind of different world will seem like it's uh, failing a lot um, but another word for that is 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 creative i'm very struck by how you're thinking obviously as you would both do of course with such um, insight about language and perhaps we could literally take on from what you've both just said and think about um the coded alternative realities and possibilities inside language i'm thinking here of etymology of course and how often the original desire the intention to bring an idea into language has been so eroded altered corrupted and and uh, redirected you know by other pressures over time over centuries of course and i wonder whether you think that inside language itself uh, is a possibility for you know a, a radical reinvention of our social reality because we need new words, clearly. Some words have been emptied out of all meaning. But is there a way that we can use language itself to, to, to become an active agent in the world, not just a, a, a carrier and conveyor of meaning? Of course, language can be very destructive, but also something that can, can actually realise a new reality in the world. Kim, mm -hmm. I'm super positive about this. I, I tend to be a little bit too Pollyanna the way I like to think about things, but um, the only where the only place to find the so-called future is in the so-called past, aka all the stuff that you have around you. Um, from a certain point of view, words are really just the past, right? And and fascism, which is arising all around the world, um, very scarily as we speak, is really an attempt to find some kind of deep meaningfulness in the past, where you will never find it in some little fragment of some meme-like or tweet-like thing that um, never will contain um, anything like a meaning. And that is why, it, from a certain linguistic point of view, the fascism is extremely violent. Um, there's, no, um, there's no way to make something great again. It never was great in the first place. Um, maybe you can find something in the future. Um, and to that extent, you know, meaning in a way is is not only from the future, it sort of is the future. And when I teach this to my undergrads, I always say something a little bit cute, like you never know how this sentence is gonna end, banana sponge, elephant, parenthesis, period, dot, dot, dot. And so, you know, the meaning and the words are actually overlapping. The meaning is not different from the words. And it's a problem with patriarchal logic that we have this idea that meaning is here and the words are here or, or false is here and true is here, but really science, which would also be, you know, non-religious world altogether, including the so-called Paleolithic wo world to a certain extent, is all about how true and false are kind of overlap all the time. So that actually the future and the past kind of overlapping. And so I'm very, um, what's, I don't know what the right word is, um, but I feel like, yes, of course, it's our, it's our duty, in fact, to try to find, to try to find it in the language. Um. Thank you, Tim, for uh, yeah, for, for talking specifically directly um, about meaning, right? Because it is the that is the da the dangerous uh, aspect of our thinking. Whether you, you you think of meaning coming out as as form as, as in abstract ways or in this more fascistically oriented Hegelian way as essence, um, and uh, and then language. If language, if we we, we are um, thinking of language in terms of of um, of a of a, a how a, a, a mode of presentation of things or words or terms or um, then language becomes 
I think can and is important when when in the in the mod moment of presentation and, and that particular mode of presentation when it postpones and avoids essence and or or form the imposition of essence or form which means exactly the the killing on the undermining of any possible creative other meaning that could be um could be arriving so to me yes something like sign language um you know may hold or, or, or something like sign language itself or, or other kinds of language modes of expression that you know we would use the name language to for it they hold something but there is always something else that is before and then in, in this in our particular case given you know the uh, organization orientation of post enlightenment thinking it is this essence and this form that always one of the things uh, when i write i'm always um i don't try to find the perfect sentence but i'm always aware of where i'm betraying myself right that word that statement that carries so many meanings and many of them totally against what i'm trying to do and then I just tell myself I have to live with it because there is no controlling of it. It's there, and it's there because you know, because that form or that essence is already attributed. That meaning is already give, already given to that term, and I have to live with it. You know, um, so that's the other side of the conversation also, right? I mean, a little bit of um, um, you know acknowledgement of the limits. What you said, Denise, made me think about the notion of listening, you know, that to me, the sort of words are like the receipts in a way that come out of the, um, I don't know what, the cash register of some kind of listening process and that acting is in fact not a kind of big, bad, you know, cutting into a continuum, but is in fact made up of little tiny, if you were going to put an action around a particle accelerator, you might find that it was made up of little tiny quantized little energy uh, wave packets of appreciating things and that actually attending to and 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 listening is how you act at least the times when i've been in a band have all been about how act when you're playing music with somebody means you're listening to them and you're listening to your musical lineage and you're listening to your instrument and that this this binary between doing a thing and attending to a thing also is part of this binary on the left between so-called incrementalism, which is coded as kind of feminine and like big, bad, proper revolutionary action by the right person who tends to be some kind of a Y chromosome person, um, you know, who just announces that they're the leader and that maybe this difference isn't so great as, as we like to think. And that maybe, again, it's, it's, it's not as impossible and that maybe people like me make it sound really difficult. To, to, to do political change, but maybe it's actually too easy in a funny way because it has to do with listening. Thank you both. Again, we're, we're sowing seeds here for future thought and, and, and uh, conversation. So many, many ideas coming as I would expect, of course, out of your wonderful responses. Now we have some other great questions coming in from the audience. Many thanks indeed for these. Thinking about thinking, which is what both of you have been doing um, in your conversation this evening. Could you talk a little bit about how imagination um, can be seen and can act critically as, as a way of, of thinking, a dimension of thinking? Because uh, for this uh, particular audience member who was amazed by the conversation, um, the feeling, the emotion, the atmosphere in what you've been communicating um, suggests, if you like, you know, imagination in action. And I wonder how imagination uh, plays off and in dialogue with thinking as a proposal forwards. Um, okay, I'll go. I'll go first. And thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah. So one of the things I like to say, and it's a joke, but it's not a joke, is that I am very much interested in um, taking the imagination and separating it from the understanding, and finally releasing it from the Kantian program, <laughs> um, which has a lot to do with you know many many of the things that we are that we are talking about. So. Yes, the imagination has a lot to do with the, with the thinking, and I think with um, 
on the one hand, it may, when we attend to, you know, to the things that we identify as, you know, coming out of the imagination, it can tell us of the limits of our thinking. And I think science fiction is so much about that, right? How far we, we can go. But then at the same time, there is the possibility of, of a bridge um, as we move away from the termination, as we, you know, move away from the attempt at saying that something is that thing and it is that thing alone for this reason alone, you know, think in terms of thinking in terms of causality or in some movements of determinacy. As we move away from from that, then yes, so the imagination as as that moment, you know, thinking also of the imagination, as that mental moment of bringing things together, it opens up to to other um, you know, yes, to other, to other possibilities. And something else I have been, you know, considering is precisely that, right? Uh, the question is what, what image of existence would, um, you know, break through separability, determinacy and, you know, and the empire of time and allow uh, for uh, a, a mode of attending to what exists human and non-human and more than human, that it's not predicated on instrumentalization and not, not geared towards efficiency and, you know, refining, et cetera. And that, so what I'm saying is that I think that moment is a moment that it is uh, with thinking, but can be analytically distinguished from thinking as something that is more on the creative side of things, right? Um, it all happens at the same time, but we can, you know, present it as if, you know, there is a, a separation between the image and then how we go about making sense. Um, Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah, I'm delighted to talk to this. And, you know, Denise said it. I mean, one thing to add, and I'm sure Denise would agree with this, that the word imagine and, and words like visualize are obviously very ocular centric you know and we have this tradition in western philosophy of this notion of, of of the ados you know a thing that you can see as in i see like we never say oh i smell to mean i i understand or agree or, or, or whatever and so sometimes i like to say sensualization rather than visualization but nevertheless that's a tiny little point but what i really want to say is new york city so when you when you hear that phrase, you, you're there, right? You, in whatever sense, yeah. Um, visualizes a feeling, unquote. Yeah, New York, New York, what a wonderful town! It's a, it's a. You can feel it. You don't build it up from little pixels on a grid. You don't. Okay, so there's Alphabet City, and then there's first and second, and then you don't. You don't do that. You sort of uh, parachute in holistically, right? And this is um, a quality of uh, what Denise is calling thinking that is actually terribly, terribly important and, and has to do with, again, this, the, 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 the possibility of the future, actually, um, that we're not completely limited to um, just kind of grinding our way through the desert of pre-existing stuff, st st stuff, that in a way, the, the concept of imagination is in a way a certain way, unalienated, um, sentient being superpower, you know, that the, 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 a lot of, you know, so patriarchal religion makes the imagination be part of, I don't know, some kind of invisible white guy with a beard in the sky who mostly wants to kill you most of the time, you know, and, and our ability to, to visualize anything at all is under attack right now. Um, and I would almost want to say, you know, just the sheer capacity to visualize is a very precious thing. I'm a student of uh, Tibetan Buddhism and uh, visualization is very, very important for that. And it's not because you're picturing something, but because you're actually feeling something and evoking something that it is in fact a kind of movement. And the visualization has a kind of evanescent, shimmery quality to it, you know, which is actually terribly important. We, 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 we tend to think that ideology is sort of everywhere and it is but that doesn't mean that it's everything because just off the corner of your eye as it were is this kind of shimmering mirage quality of, of things are really still moving 
you know, in no, no, no matter what concept is saying they are. And so I think imagination is speaking to that quality, you know, which seems incredibly um, weak, maybe, or fragile, but is in fact an amazingly powerful force, I feel, um, once we figure out how to, how to tune to it. Tremendous. Thank you again, as always. We've got four more questions and obviously please feel free to, to answer them each or, or both of you as you see fit. Thinking forward a little bit about this idea of how our thinking enacts itself in the world and also what you've just said, Tim, about visualisation. One of the ways we've obviously encountered the world visually and you know sensorially over the last 18 months or so is through screens. And uh, a question here about the medium itself of communication and exchange at this point. Um, does the medium, the media, uh, in this case, let's say Zoom or a platform as we're on, insisting as it does on the singular, the subjective, the individual, constrain the capacity by definition for a larger, more polyrhythmic and fractal form of thinking as you've both discussed? If that's the case, what can we do about this? And how can we disrupt the very medium that allows us to con communicate with each other, but at the same time, of course, insists on maintaining its own status quo? Um, shall I take this first, Denise? Um, any excuse to have a good old moan about Zoom, right? I mean, here we all are in our little squares doing this kind of Muppet Show thing where we're all sort of waving to each other. Not that I dislike the Muppet Show at all. Um, I think perhaps it's not so much about individualism as it is about the, um, let's say, uh, computational regularity right? We've got this grid, you know, what's wrong with QAnon? They, they present photographs of people winking and doing this. And because it's organized by a computer in a grid, people think, oh, that must mean something. There's this minimum of meaningfulness. What is very cool about, say, teaching in a classroom, which I just started to do again, is actually that they, in a funny way, please don't tell the dean because I'll be fired if, I, if we put it this way, but face-to-face -face teaching has less information in it. In Zoom, everything means something, right? There's a little chat box, there's a little square that defines where I am and where Denise is and so on. And everything is kind of hyper-significant and it doesn't leave you any room in a way to do this visualization imagination that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with it really, that it is this kind of claustrophobia because in a funny way, it's richer than non-zoom space you know mm -hmm. in, in non-zoom space there's all these things like the, the 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 there's a fan rotating that you can't see there's the fact that i have a certain smell of the hairspray that i put on earlier there's the strange kind of light that i put on the table from ikea that looks really wrong when you were to actually look at it and it doesn't i mean i'm not actually in this kind of pristine stage set really <laughs> um and I think this would be something that Derrida would say, right? That, 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 that sentences and phrases and ideas are always mediated in some way. And that, you know, knowing that about them is actually part of how to um, liberate oneself from the oppressiveness of them. Now, I don't know if I can outline a program for exactly how to change Zoom in, in particular right this minute, but um, I, I think what it is, is, is to do with an excess of this sort of claustrophobic informationality, to, to coin a phrase. Yes, um, I don't have much to add, but just highlighting the immediacy, right? The, the two things with social media, it is this immediacy, everything is very there, very present, as you're saying, Tim. And then I to say also the fact that it is an immediate interpolation at the level of affect, right? It is about liking, right? It is about, it is, it is almost empty. It's not empty. That little thing that has no meaning carries a lot of affect. How many people liked what I posted on Instagram? Um, and that's something we have to attend to, um, but it is, uh, but I think it, is, it will be, um, how do I say that? Like, I think like everything else, there will be um, many ways through which we will dis, you know, design modes of separating effectively. Um, and, and this I think is very difficult, but it's not impossible <laughs> that you can use something that appeals to you to, so immediately at the, level, at the level of affect 
and then and and at the same time to keep some like okay the thing is doing it to me i i don't know uh, how exactly we will do it but the recent uh, the recent conversation and and things happening with the facebook indicates that you know <laughs> folks are taking action some ways <laughs> It's this concept of immediacy that is perhaps the most oppressive, right? It's like whoever has the right reaction the fastest is the winner. Yeah, therefore, the person with the most leisure time is the winner. Therefore, the most privileged person is the winner in the Facebook environment. It just maintains the status quo, only sort of automate, you know. Um, and so absolutely to that, like that, try how to introduce some kind of hesitancy actually that will be much more productive than knowing immediately what to think and feel thank you both again i mean very important to follow on that idea if you like about time tim and, and, and the privilege um that uh, a certain kind of uh, class position allows in relation to time now with long player as a framework for this conversation we are of course both aware of its quality in a linear sense it moves forward for a thousand years but it's also very much as a project of circularity. It repeats after a thousand years and during its own generative development, elements within it are moving alongside each other in a circular frame. So given the importance of time, Denise, you mentioned earlier how important it is to be able to find ways to act now as opposed to delaying a kind of action into a proposed sort of utopian future to use my, my own words here. How do we think about this relationship in time between the experience of a linearity and yet knowing there are larger forms that are moving around us quite literally and where we place our kind of our own pressure points of action and response and, and creative possibilities as, you, as you've talked about so well um i would say and then i think my answer is, is going to be very you know short and not in a bad sense but in a good sense um that it is the now right um i, I keep thinking uh, be, uh, when we were talking about the imagination i was thinking about uh, benjamin and and the dialectical image that now um that now that i have in mind it's not not a now in a sequence in time but it is a now in the configuration in which of which the time that that duration right the time that passes even if it is the thousand year time of long player is it's there but it's not determining it's not the privileged way of of making sense of 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 this now so so long player is going to be playing a thousand, you know a little less than a thousand years from now but every time it's playing it's playing now and in 200 mm -hmm. years as it is playing nobody will know what played today right and we can't anticipate what will be playing later so here now this moment mm -hmm. but this moment opening up to the cosmic and opening in up to the quantic and everything else right i mean in this in this now um mm -hmm. So it is not about totally, completely, oh, sorry, uh, ignoring time, but it is, it is more about play, putting time in its place, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. As somebody who practices meditation, I'm going to say that very hesitantly because actually I, I'm very, very lazy and bad at doing it. Um, there is the in the um, uh, corporate world right now the concept of mindfulness, um, which very much has to do with the kind of of um, the kind of time that Denise is arguing against. Yeah, um, that one fixates actually on a certain concept of of time, um, and then uses that to kind of replace other thoughts. A little bit like the occupied sign in the toilet on the plane you sort of replace all these other thoughts with this um being in the present this is not the kind of now i feel that we're talking about here and the the word i would use is nowness um which might actually be quite like a word that benjamin uses for this notion of now um insofar as it is a quality it has a texture to it it's not just a sort of some kind of abstract point on a line um and um, it's the, the, there is a movement inside of it intrinsically. It is not um, a static dot, but actually there is a feeling when you're when when nowness is is happening, or or, or you're letting 
nowness be part of your experience, uh, experience that things are kind of constantly evaporating, right? That, 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 that there is not this kind of solid identity that actually um, like a sort of piece of dry ice that your, your thoughts and your feelings and all your, your, your physical being is sort of evaporating all the time. And this is a very useful, powerful thing um, and it is not this um, corporate concept, I think, of, of, of a kind of fetishization of a certain kind of clock time. Um, and of course, the corporate world latched onto mindfulness, which is really just a tool that enables you to, you know, um, realize that something more important, which is a kind of uh, something one might call a, a awareness rather than mindfulness, I think. Thank you so much uh, to our audience, first of all, for wonderful questions. Um, there's much more we could have uh, spoken about. And of course, these are just prompts really for further conversation um, and uh, many, many ways that we can take these conversations forward. Before I uh, do round up proceedings um, here in the very much in the, in the now moment of our experience, um, I'd just like to remind you, of course, of many further events at the British Library, not least tomorrow, um, uh, in collaboration with Invisible Dust, uh, a day-long event, Living Nature, Art, Science and Indigenous Knowledge, which undoubtedly will take on some of these thoughts in their own ways um, that we've been uh, sharing and uh, experiencing tonight. Please do find that, of course, in the ways that you know how. It's free to attend with everything available online. Uh, long Player has a very particular project unfolding right now, uh, available to, to visit in London, if you are in London, to the 21st of November. Sonic Ray turns sound into light and back into sound in the very real environment of the London Docklands. Please do find details of that on the Art Angel website. And if you would like to support Long Player um, into its uh, remaining 978 years of uh, first time playing, and please do visit longplayer.org where you can find every uh, aspect of Long Player's project uh, detailed for you, including the buying time uh, supporting of Long Player by hosting a day uh, in, in the calendar year of your choice. There's much more we could say. There's much more we could say about our wonderful guests, but please do find their books in all the ways you know how. It's been a real pleasure um, to be a small part of this wonderful conversation. I'd like to thank Rebecca and her team behind the scenes at Unique Media, John Fawcett and his team at the British Library, everyone at Art Angel and the Long Player Trust, especially Sarah, Mike and Ella. But please, wherever you are, raise your glasses, raise your hands, cheer out loudly and possibly break, as Emma Goldman always advised, into a form of dance. Dance, of course, being a form of your own choice, whatever dance you might like to do so. Um, to thank uh, for their wonderful insights, their presence with us today and their ongoing incredible activity in the world. Denise Ferreira de Silva and Timothy Morton. Thank you very much indeed and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.